Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. It's a little more hospitable in here today, temperature-wise, at least. Yeah. Um, have a few things at the top, and then we'll. Isn't that because the building was empty for the last three days, and the air conditioning was probably? I think we also made a request to to, to raise the temperature a little bit. Yes. Yes. Correct. Looking out for your uh, for, for your needs. Um, uh, before we begin, uh, a few things. Yesterday marked World Refugee Day. Uh, I would like to underscore the message shared by the Secretary and the Department, acknowledging the unprecedented humanitarian crises across the globe, resulting in the largest number of refugees in history. For the first time in history, last month, the number of people forced to flee conflicts, violence, human rights abuses, and, and persecution reached more than 100 million. That means more than 1% of the world's population has been forcibly displaced. The United States reaffirms our unwavering commitment to alleviate the suffering of the world's most vulnerable people through our global leadership in humanitarian assistance and diplomacy. We are the world's largest single donor of humanitarian assistance, providing more than $13 billion in humanitarian aid during fiscal year 2021. We also recognize the generosity of communities that host refugees and the united global response of international humanitarian partners who work diligently to help them. We will continue to represent the best of American values by saving lives and alleviating suffering, working with our partners at home and abroad to assist those forcibly displaced in their time of need, no matter who they are, or where they, no matter who they are, where they are on World Refugee Day and every day. Next, the United States congratulates the Colombian people for holding a free and fair presidential election on June 19th. The United States welcomes the results of the second round of elections. We look forward to working with President-elect Gustavo Petro and his new administration and to continuing our strong collaboration and joint regional leadership. The U.S.-Colombia relationship remains based on shared democratic values, and we remain committed to working with the next Colombian administration in support of our mutual goals. Those goals include supporting Colombia's implementation of the 2016 Peace Accord, reducing violence and narcotics trafficking, expanding rural development and security, promoting human rights, growing inclusive trade and investment, protecting the environment, and combating the climate crisis. On June 19th, we also celebrated the 200th anniversary of the U.S. Uh, of the U.S. Colombia diplomatic relationship. Together with the people of Colombia, we, we built this enduring partnership that reflects the deep ties between our societies, our economies, our security, and our efforts to build a more democratic and equitable hemisphere. And finally, Earlier today, Ambassador at Large for Global Criminal Justice, Beth Van Skok, accompanied Attorney General Merrick Garland for a quick visit uh, to Zhezhev, Poland, and the Ukrainian-Poland border. At the border, they met with Ukraine's Prosecutor General, Irina Benediktova, uh, to further advance U.S.-Ukraine cooperation and supportive efforts to hold accountable those responsible for war crimes and other atrocities during Russia's unprovoked and brutal war on Ukraine. They also held meeting with US meetings, excuse me, with US government partners working on accountability and justice issues in Ukraine. This included the leadership of the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group, ACA, our joint initiative with the EU and the UK to support Prosecutor General Venegatova's work to document war crimes and prepare case files for prosecution. They also met partners from the Department of Justice's International Criminal Investigation Training Assistant Assistance Program, or ECTAP. Uh, which provides assistance to Ukraine's State Border Guard Service and National Police. ECTAP efforts in Ukraine are jointly funded by the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, or INL, and the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation, or ISN, uh, ex and their Export Control and Related Border Security Program. Attorney General Garland, uh, upon the visit, noted that the United States is sending an unmistakable message. There is no place to hide. We and our partners will pursue every avenue available to ensure that those who are responsible for these atrocities are held accountable. Ambassador Van Skok will accompany Attorney General Garland to Paris, where she will join the AG, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, and other U.S. officials for meetings of the U.S.-EU Ministerial Meeting on Justice and Home Affairs, and we'll have additional information on that event in the coming days. So with that, great. any questions? Thanks, Deb. Um, I have a, a, a very brief one, but it's going to be brief because I think you're not, not going to have much of an answer. But since we haven't had a briefing since Friday when this decision was made by the British government on the extradition of um, uh, Julian Assange, I just wanted to check to see um, if there had been any change in your policy that either mm -hmm. journalism is not a crime or if there's been any change to the, your belief that Julian Assange is not journalist. 
Uh, Matt, there has been uh, no change, and there has been no change to the answer I uh, delivered to you last time on this matter. We defer to the Department of Justice uh, when it comes to all cases of extradition. Uh, I would refer you to the Department of Justice yeah, because this is an ongoing uh, matter before uh, the British courts uh, and an extradition case. But, but it still is your position as it was on World Press Freedom Day not so long ago that journalism is not, that is, should not be a crime. That right? is absolutely our conviction. Thanks. Can you, or did you have something on that? So I have, but this is, um, sure. your colleague, uh, actually colleagues, plural, at the White House kind of had a little State Department briefing earlier. Uh, it's quite interesting because a lot of, I think, of what you're going to be asked today was, has already been asked and answered, but, um, uh, your White House colleague, uh, not Mr. Herbie, uh, press, sec press secretary, uh, was asked about uh, Brittany Griner and this phone call that was supposed to have happened the other day, and she said it was her understanding that it had been has been rescheduled. <clears throat> so, wondering if you could elaborate on that, but also, uh, you know, explaining you know, what happened. What the, the, Sure. Uh, as you heard earlier today, the phone call has been rescheduled. It's not for us to provide specific timing because uh, there's not official U.S. government involvement uh, in this call. This is not a call between uh, a U.S. official and a detained American. This is uh, a call between uh, two private Americans, one of whom uh, is wrongfully detained uh, by Russia, has been wrongfully detained uh, for too long, in whose case we are working assiduously uh, to see her release uh, just as quickly um, as can possibly be achieved. I think what you heard earlier today is absolutely the case. We deeply uh, regret that uh, Brittany Griner was able, unable to speak to her wife uh, over the weekend because of a logistical error. It was uh, a mistake. It is a mistake that uh, we have worked to rectify. As we said before, the call has been uh, rescheduled uh, and will take place in, in, in relatively uh, short order. Uh, it was a logistical issue that was compounded in part by the fact that uh, our embassy in Moscow is under significant restrictions uh, in terms of its staffing. Uh, and so when we have issues with uh, the telephone system there, for example, uh, the technicians are not located on site. In fact, they're not even located in Russia. Uh, they have to be located in a third country um, because of the onerous restrictions that uh, the Russian Federation has placed uh, on our embassy and its operations. So all of that compounded uh, what was uh, a mistake, what was a logistical error, uh, and uh, we look forward to the opportunity for Brittany Griner to speak to her wife uh, in short order. But whatever the whatever the specifics of that logistical error, you're confident that when this call is rescheduled, you know, whenever it's supposed to happen, it's going to happen, and the same thing isn't going to happen again. Uh, we are we are confident of that. We have we have done everything we can to, to rectify this. Thank you. Uh, Francesca. Um, about the tensions uh, around Kaliningrad, what do you make of uh, the statements uh, from Russia uh, threatening of serious consequences and trying? Well, we aren't going to speculate on Russian saber rattling or Russian bluster. Don't even want to give it additional uh, airtime. Uh, we have been very clear uh, over the course of Russia's war against Ukraine, and in fact, well before uh, Russia began its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, uh, that our commitment to NATO and uh, specifically our commitment to NATO's Article 5, uh, the premise that an attack on one uh, would constitute an attack on all, uh, that commitment on the part of the United States is ironclad. Uh, not only have we made that clear rhetorically, uh, but together uh, with NATO uh, and with our own um, uh, announcements of, of, of troop posture uh, adjustments, uh, we have reinforced uh, our commitment to the NATO alliance. We have reinforced uh, NATO's eastern flank, especially those countries uh, who uh, have been uh, at the forefront uh, of Russian threats over uh, the course, in many cases, of uh, many years. We, uh, of course, appreciate the unprecedented economic measures that uh, many countries around the world, uh, dozens of countries across uh, continents, uh, that uh, our allies and our partners, including in this case Lithuania, uh, have uh, joined us in taking uh, against Russia for its unprovoked uh, war in Ukraine, uh, of course, would refer you to Lithuania regarding its enforcement of, of EU sanctions. Do you fully support Lithuanian enforcement of their sanctions and against any threat from Russia? Uh, Lithuania is a member of the NATO alliance. We stand by the commitments 
uh, that we have made uh, to the NATO alliance. That includes, of course, a commitment uh, to Article 5. That is the bedrock uh, of the NATO alliance. This is uh, a campaign that includes dozens of countries around the world, uh, including blocks of countries, in this case, uh, the EU, uh, but also individual countries using their national authorities. Lithuania has been a stalwart partner in this. We stand by NATO, we stand by our NATO allies, uh, and we stand by Lithuania. Mara. Ned, um, on uh, New York Times also came out over the weekend with an investigation about the killing of Palestinian-American journalist Shireen Abu Akhle. Um, basically, they are also saying, just like all of the other media outlets who have uh, done a similar investigation, that the bullet was fired from the approximate location of the Israeli military convoy. So I'm just wondering, in light of this like mounting new information, is the United States going to, going to do anything more to press the Israelis to speed up their investigation? And are you going to do anything differently? Maybe like consider conducting your own investigation since this is a U.S. citizen? Uh, Humara, we have uh, been in close and constant touch with our Israeli and with our Palestinian partners as well. Uh, we have sought in just about all of these conversations uh, to bridge cooperation between the parties. We want to see the parties uh, cooperate. We believe that enhanced cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians on this investigation uh, will facilitate what is and what should be a, a collective goal and that is an, account, an investigation that culminates in accountability. Uh, that's what we uh, would like to see happen. We've made clear uh, our view, again, both to Israelis and Palestinians, uh, that uh, we seek a thorough, transparent, and impartial investigation into Shireen Abu Akhla's, uh killing. Uh, we expect full accountability for uh, those responsible. Uh, and we have urged to that end, as I alluded to a moment ago, that the two sides share their evidence with one another. We believe the sharing of evidence and the bridging of these investigations uh, will help facilitate um, uh, accountability, uh, right. an investigation that, that culminates in that. Do you mean by that you guys are pushing for like a joint investigation because the Israelis are conducting their own? Like exactly what kind of bridging are we, to what end are we talking about? The, the two sides are conducting their own investigations. Uh, we're not necessarily calling for a joint investigation, but we are calling uh, on the two sides to share evidence with one another. Uh, we believe, again, that by sharing evidence, uh, we will be able to, or the two sides, I should say, uh, will be able to facilitate um, what is... Uh, our goal, what should be a collective goal, and that is an investigation uh, that is impartial, that's transparent, that's transparent, that's thorough, and that culminates in accountability. Are you considering conducting your own? And if you're not, why not? Uh, we're, we're, that is not on the table uh, at the moment. Uh, the two parties, the two sides, the Israelis, the Palestinians, uh, are conducting their own investigations. Uh, we want to see those investigations be conducted in a way that's thorough, uh, that's impartial, that's transparent, and that culminates in accountability. We believe that can be accomplished most effectively uh, if the two sides uh, share evidence with one another, that's, if they bridge their investigations in that way. That's not on the table. Could that be on the table in the coming weeks, months, if the Israeli investigation or this cooperation that you're pushing for um, doesn't come through? Again, I'm not going to weigh in on a hypothetical. We want to see the two parties work together constructively uh, because we believe it should be a collective goal of all three of us and, of course, every other country um, that has a stake uh, not only in this particular killing but also in this uh, broader issue of press freedom and ensuring that uh, the press, independent media around the world are afforded adequate protections uh, that uh, that interest is served. Okay, just super quickly on the... Um, on the final thing on Israel, uh, Defense Minister Benny Gantz basically briefed lawmakers the other day about this Middle East Air Defense Alliance, saying that this has been going on for some time, basically U.S.-sponsored regional air defense alliance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Which countries are in this? What is the exact U.S. role? Is this going to be something that President Biden will talk at length about when he's there? I don't have any specifics to offer uh, at this time. Uh, we've, talking, we, we've spoken at length uh, previously uh, about the cooperation uh, we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran's destabilizing uh, activities throughout the region. Uh, of course, Iran is a country that exports uh, its malign influence not only in the Middle East but well beyond. We cooperate very closely 
uh, with our Israeli partners. We cooperate very closely uh, with our Arab partners uh, and with a number of other countries uh, around the world to counter Iran's malign influence. Saeed. Thank you. I just want to follow up on Hamara's, uh, on Shireen. Now, you believe that Israel's track record proves that it can conduct a transparent and thorough investigation in this particular case? Uh, Said, we've spoken to uh, previous historical analogies. Israel does have the wherewithal to conduct uh, an investigation that is transparent, that is impartial, uh, and that importantly culminates uh, in accountability. Uh, that's what we would like to see happen. I mean, how often does this happen? <coughs> I, Said, I, we've... Well, I mean, you know, we don't want to, to compare notes and, and so on, but I can assure you there are not very many examples that show uh, Israel can commit to a transparent and thorough, thorough uh, investigation. I want to go back. We've, we've, spoken, we've spoken of previous examples. We've spoken of the example of Yad Halak, uh, for example, one such example. Uh, but again, uh, I'm speaking for I'm speaking for what the United States uh, is asking for. What we seek, we seek an investigation that is transparent, that's impartial, that culminates in accountability. Okay. I want to ask you about what I asked you last week, which is you know the Secretary of State asked by Abby Martin uh, responded by saying that he calls for an independent independent investigation. What does that mean? Have you reflected on what he said? Is there a mechanism that you have in mind? that an independent uh, investigation could be pursued? The Secretary was not signaling a change in our approach. He was not signaling anything different than what I just said uh, right now. What we are calling for, what uh, we are seeking, what much of the international community is seeking, uh, is uh, a set of investigations. There are two in this case, but investigations uh, that are impartial, that are transparent, that culminate in accountability. I have a couple more questions on, on Israel. Now, the collapse of the Israeli coalition. I wonder what, what is your comment on that? How is that likely to uh, impact whatever ongoing programs that you have with the Israelis, whether it's the, the, the JCPOA or, or anything else, or possible, you know, the possible even uh, normalization of other countries and so on. How do you see this impacting your policy towards the Palestinian Israeli conflict? I don't expect uh, political developments in Israel uh, will have implications for what we are seeking to accomplish together with our Israeli partners or with our Palestinian uh, partners for that matter. And that's because Israel is a strategic partner uh, of the United States. It's a fellow democracy. We respect its democratic processes. Uh, one of the strengths of the bilateral U.S.-Israeli relationship, uh, a strength that has uh, come to be formed over uh, the course of many decades, uh, is the bipartisan support it has in this country, uh, is the fact that uh, the strength of our relationship uh, does not uh, depend on who sits in the Oval Office. It doesn't depend uh, on who sits uh, in the Prime Minister's chair uh, in Israel. This is a strategic partnership between our two countries. It will continue to be uh, a strategic partnership between our two countries uh, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, uh, as the process plays mm -hmm. out. As we stare into the fifth possible election in three years and the specter of Mr. Netanyahu making a comeback. Again, Saeed, this is a strategic relationship. Uh, it does not depend uh, on who sits in the Oval Office. It does not depend uh, on who sits in the Prime Minister's chair. I promise my last on refugees, because you mentioned refugees. You know, my heart goes out to all refugees, and especially Palestinian refugees that have been languishing for more than uh, 70 years. There is a UN resolution, the General Assembly resolution, that calls for their return ever since it, it, it happened. Why cannot you? Why can't you support this call by the United Nations? Said, so there are a number of so-called final status issues. Uh, the uh, right of return is one of the so-called final status issues. Uh, what we seek to do is to create the conditions uh, to advance the prospects over the longer term for a two-state solution between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, that's what we are trying to set in place now. Those conditions. Uh, in the case of the Palestinian people, we are trying to do that. Uh, in part with our significant humanitarian support uh, to provide to the Palestinian people in the West Bank uh, and in the Gaza Strip uh, what they need to uh, have more prosperity, have more stability, uh, have, at the end of the day, uh, the dignity uh, that they deserve. Again, our approach to this conflict uh, is based on what should be a very simple and non-controversial premise uh, that Israelis and Palestinians alike 
deserve equal measures of security, of prosperity, uh, of dignity. Uh, and that is what we assessed, as have previous administrations, uh, would be best accomplished by a two-state solution. And what about Israel? Sure. Um, you mentioned that uh, the collapse of the Israeli government isn't going to have an impact on, on policy. Where, where does this does this mean that President Biden's promise of a consulate in Jerusalem is going to go unfulfilled? Just because there was a widely assumed uh, belief that the, the the reason that this wasn't uh, uh, implemented is because the administration feared the collapse of the Israeli government. So that's why they weren't. They weren't fulfilling Biden's promise to open a consulate, but it's collapsed now. So what, where are we in this process? What, is, that, is that actually going to happen? We remain committed uh, to reopening a consulate in Jerusalem. In the meantime, uh, we have uh, really re-energized the relationship between the United States and the Palestinian Authority, uh, but also the Palestinian people. And I spoke to our humanitarian support, uh, but of course, we've had a number of opportunities, I believe most recently when Barbara Leaf uh, traveled to Ramallah uh, to meet at, including at senior levels, uh, with the Palestinian leadership. Secretary Blinken uh, has had an opportunity in, in the past couple of weeks to speak uh, to President uh, Abbas, President Biden, uh, when he travels to Bethlehem uh, in the coming uh, weeks. We'll have an opportunity, I would expect, uh, to meet with uh, the leadership of the PA. Uh, this does nothing to uh, our uh, what remains our objective of opening, uh, excuse me, reopening uh, the consulate in uh, Jerusalem. As you know, we've recently taken uh, some steps, including uh, changes to the reporting structure uh, so that um, uh, our diplomats in uh, Jerusalem can report back directly uh, to State Department headquarters. Uh, we are taking steps to see to it uh, that we can continue to engage constructively uh, with the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people. Has the concern now shifted from the collapse of the government to uh, any steps either on the consulate or maybe JCPOA would bolster a potential Netanyahu return to power? Uh, as I said before, our relationship with Israel does not depend on uh, who sits in the prime minister's chair. We certainly uh, don't take steps or avoid steps for that matter. Uh, based on any potential political developments in Israel, we are confident uh, in the bilateral relationship between the United States and Israel uh, such that uh, we can uh, pursue U.S. national interests and we can uh, pursue the many interests we share together uh, with our Israeli partners uh, as partners. That's what we'll continue to do in advance of the president's travel uh, and the aftermath of it as well. Sir, on yes. you Green. Um, I know the State Department confirmed the death of U.S. citizen Stephen Zabielski. I was wondering if the department could confirm some details that have been circulating and reporting that he was an Army veteran and that he was killed by a landmine. Can you provide any additional confirmation of those details? I'm not in a position to uh, provide, provide any additional details. We did, in fact, um, confirm uh, his death, but in terms of any of the spe specifics, um, of uh, his his death, uh, that is just not something uh, I can weigh in on. In part, uh, out of respect uh, for uh, the family during uh, this difficult time. And then on the mis the captured Americans in Ukraine, uh, I would like to follow up on a comment uh, by my colleague at Mises, Keir Simmons, um, with Dmitry Peskov saying that they are not subject to the Geneva Convention. I know that the Biden administration weighed in on this today, but. What is your response to Peskov saying that those Americans are not subject to the Geneva Convention uh, and it can't be applied for, quote, soldiers of fortune? Well, let me, let me start uh, with the issue uh, broadly and just note that we are working hard uh, to learn more about reports of Americans who may be uh, in Russian custody or in the custody of Russian proxy forces. Uh, we have been in touch with Russian authorities uh, regarding U.S. citizens who may have been captured uh, while fighting in Ukraine. As I mentioned uh, last week, late last week, we've also been in touch uh, with our Ukrainian partners, with the ICRC, uh, with other countries, as well as with the families uh, of Americans who have been uh, reported missing uh, in Ukraine. We have both publicly as well as uh, privately called on the Russian government and its proxies to live up to their international obligations uh, in their treatment of all individuals, including those uh, captured fighting in Ukraine. Uh, we expect, and in fact, 
uh, international law and the law of war uh, expects and requires uh, that all those who have been captured on the battlefield uh, be treated humanely and respe with respect and consistent with uh, the laws of war. We once again uh, should take this opportunity to reiterate uh, to Americans the inherent dangers uh, of traveling to Ukraine. For weeks now, we have been urging Americans not to travel to Ukraine because of the attendant dangers uh, that Russia's aggression uh, inside Ukraine uh, poses to uh, U.S. citizens who may be there. Our message to U.S. citizens who are in Ukraine is that they should uh, depart immediately uh, using any commercial or other privately available uh, transportation means. We understand certainly that there are uh, Americans across this country, millions of Americans across this country who feel motivated uh, to support uh, the righteous and the noble cause of the Ukrainian people. Uh, there are ways to do that, uh, that work to the direct benefit of the Ukrainian people, ways that are safe, ways that are helpful and constructive. We have many of those ways uh, on our website. Do Just one follow-up. Do we know, does the U.S. government know where these Americans are, and has the Kremlin even confirmed that they have been captured or know where they are? We have no additional details beyond what's been reported in the media, including by some of your own media organizations. Uh, as I said, we've been in direct contact uh, with Russian authorities. We have not been provided uh, either by Russian authorities or by Russian proxy forces or any other uh, entity with uh, additional uh, details uh, of the whereabouts uh, of these Americans. We are pursuing every channel, every opportunity we have uh, to learn more uh, and to support uh, their families, especially in this difficult hour. Just to follow up on that, can you, can you, let, let me well, follow up. Does this has to do with the death, and I just want to know one thing. I, know, I realize there are privacy concerns. Can you at least say when you became, when you learned of this man's death? And because it's a bit odd that the local newspaper obituary from which this news came and which you have them confirmed was published on June 1st. Yes, my understanding is that we is that we uh, learned of this individual's death several weeks ago. Uh, it is not uh, uh, it is not our uh, standard procedures to, to formally announce uh, when American has been killed, but, uh, but before the obit or after his death on May 20th. My understanding is that we learned of it before June 1st. Yeah, on the same point, the Russians claim there are 450 Americans fighting with the Ukrainians. Do you have, can you confirm that figure or is that too inflated? Do you have any way of knowing how many Americans are fighting alongside the, uh, the Ukrainians? We, we don't uh, have any means to corroborate that figure. I would just uh, note that we uh, often encourage uh, Americans and all others to take uh, anything the, the Kremlin says with a, with a grain of salt. Uh, but in terms of that specific piece of information, it's not something I can confirm or refute. Alex. Are you in a position to be a little bit more specific on whom in the Russian government you are in touch with? Because Medvedev said, said over the weekend that we don't have any relationship with the United States. You know, there are zero on the government scale. Well, I, uh, uh, I think our embassy officials in Moscow uh, would be surprised to hear that uh, because we do have uh, an embassy in Moscow uh, that continues to function, as I said before, in a different context. Uh, it functions under severe constraints, uh, but we have worked hard, despite the onerous and unnecessary restrictions that the Russians have imposed on our embassy operations to maintain uh, an, a, a fully functioning, or I should say a functioning, uh, embassy compound. Uh, Ambassador Sullivan uh, is here in Washington attending the Chiefs of Mission uh, conference, but he will uh, soon be returning to Moscow to lead uh, the small but very capable team at uh, Embassy Moscow. The embassy does regularly uh, take part in uh, exchanges uh, and have discussions with uh, their counterparts in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, or elsewhere uh, within the Russian government. One of the issues that the embassy does regularly discuss uh, with their Russian counterparts uh, is the status of Americans who are detained uh, in Russia, the status of uh, our embassy uh, as well, to try to preserve, preserve what we believe is a uh, critical outpost. Uh, we have done everything we can uh, to preserve lines of communication between uh, the Russian government and the United States. Uh, we have done that at great effort. 
uh, not because uh, we are uh, at a spe uh, especially uh, rosy time uh, in terms of our relationship, but we believe that uh, during times of conflict, uh, during times of crisis, that channels of communication, including uh, the channel that our embassy affords, uh, is especially vital and is especially uh, important. And it's been a valuable one for us uh, to pass precisely these types of messages. Kylie. Um, just while we're on Russia, Ukraine, um, Project Dynamo, an independent organization, just put out a press release saying that John Spore, who's an American nuclear scientist who was stuck in Ukraine um, and was being hunted by Russian forces um, in Russian-occupied territory in Ukraine is now um, being taken out of the country by Project Dynamo. Are, is the State Department in touch with this organization about this, um, what they're calling a rescue effort? I'm not uh, familiar, immediately familiar with the particulars of this case. It sounds like uh, the press release was just issued. Uh, if we have anything to add, uh, we'll certainly let you know. And just generally speaking, um, uh, due to you know, the lack of U.S. military presence on the ground in Ukraine, um, do you guys support these independent organizations' efforts to get Americans out if they need you know, on-the-ground assistance that can be provided? Whether uh, this is, uh, whether it is uh, the efforts of private Americans, private American organizations, uh, our guidance remains. Uh, Americans should not travel to Ukraine. Uh, traveling to Ukraine uh, brings with it uh, significant and profound uh, dangers, uh, including some of the dangers we've already talked about uh, during the course of uh, this briefing. So whether for individuals or organizations, uh, that guidance uh, is, is constant. Will? I just wanted to follow up on the captured Americans. Is, um, you know, Russia says that, that, they're, that they were captured by the forces of some of these breakaway statelets. So is the U.S. working with Russia uh, about the release, and is that working out and working with Russia, or is there some need to negotiate with with uh, others, you know, about about the status and what's going to happen? With them? In other words, is is Russia acting as is sort of the uh, you know, the force behind these these proxy forces? Is that working out? Uh, it, it's difficult for us to say at this point. As I noted before, we have been in contact with Russian authorities regarding uh, the reports of detained uh, Americans. We have not. Uh, received any formal or official response. The only response we've seen uh, has been the response that Russian officials have made uh, in public uh, interviews. So uh, we just don't have anything from uh, that private engagement. Yes. Uh, um, after a long pause, uh, once again, we are witnessing a new naval confrontation between Iran and U.S. Um, in Persian Gulf. Any reactions to that? I, I would refer you to the Department of Defense. Uh, they may have more for you, but uh, we have seen not only in uh, recent days, but over the course of many uh, weeks and months, uh, that Iran has engaged in maritime activity that is unsafe, uh, that is unprofessional, that puts uh, sailors uh, at risk. Uh, it is something that uh, we have condemned. It is something that we have urged Iran uh, not to engage in. Also, we are seeing some efforts from U.S. allies in the region that you are trying to persuade Biden to change um, the course, to come up with a new strategy towards Iran. Um, I want to specifically ask about Biden's trip to region. How much of this trip is about Iran? And can you give us more detail if any meetings are planned regarding Iran? I'm not aware that there will be a, a meeting specifically focused on Iran. This, this trip, I should also add, hasten to add, uh, is a few weeks away still. Uh, and of course, it's a White House trip, so I'll defer ultimately to the White House to, to speak to it. But uh, I will say it's my uh, str strong suspicion, and I think you've heard, heard this from uh, the White House, that Iran will be a topic of conversation naturally uh, during uh, at least a couple of these stops. Uh, when the president is in Jerusalem uh, meeting with Israeli officials, when he, he is in Jeddah, uh, meeting with uh, members of the GCC plus three, uh, as well as uh, taking part in bilateral meetings with uh, Saudi officials, uh, that, of course, uh, the threat that Iran poses uh, in its many manifestations, not only its nuclear program, uh, but its ballistic missile program, its support for regional proxies, its support for, uh, for terrorist groups, uh, the full panoply uh, of malign influence and threats uh, that Iran poses, uh, I would imagine, will be a topic of discussion. 
Okay, and one, uh, another one about the latest uh, report by uh, UN Nuclear Watchdog about Fordo and Iran starting uh, to use more than 100 IR-6 centrifuges. Anything about that? Any updates about the nuclear talks? Well, we've seen these reports. Uh, we remain concerned that Iran continues to deploy advanced centrifuges well beyond the limits of what's prescribed in the JCPOA. Uh, we are seeking a full return to implementation of the JCPOA precisely uh, because we believe that Iran's nuclear activities, including uh, the centrifuge component manufacturing that you referred to, should be strictly limited uh, and strictly monitored by uh, the IAEA. And of course, the JCPOA carried with it the most stringent verification and monitoring regime ever uh, peacefully negotiated. The fact is, and we've made this point on a number of occasions, Iran's program uh, in different ways has now far exceeded uh, the limits that the JCPOA uh, imposed. It is spinning cascades of advanced centrifuges that are not allowed under the deal. Its fissile material breakout time has been uh, dramatically reduced uh, from about a year uh, to what is now, uh, what can now be measured uh, in weeks or even less. Uh, we are deeply concerned uh, by the current state of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, it's precisely why we want to see those strict limits, uh, that verification and monitoring regime reimposed uh, on Iran. But you still believe that returning to JCPOA is going to be within U.S. interest, even though you describe all of these concerns? Well, all of these concerns exist when the JCPOA is not being fully implemented. Uh, if we were to fully implement, if Iran were to fully implement uh, the JCPOA, many of the concerns that you just alluded to, that I just alluded to, would be taken off the table uh, because they would not be permitted. And the IAEA would have the wherewithal uh, to be able to inspect, uh, to have real-time uh, monitoring, uh, to alert the international community if Iran uh, surpass those limits. That is not the case now, and that's what gives us such great concern. But it is the case. It's still not permitted under the JCPOA. Uh, and, 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 and Iran is not fully compliant with the JCPOA. I, I, I know, but yes. I mean, it's not the case that they are now allowed to do these kinds of things. I, uh, Iran has distanced itself from the strict yeah. limits well, that the JCPOA imposed. Uh, after the last administration decided to walk away from the JCPOA, when Iran, by the way, was fully implementing and in, uh, in strict compliance uh, with the JCPOA, uh, as uh, as uh, confirmed by the IAEA. Anything else on Iran or the Middle East, uh, Nazira? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm surprised. Two question. One question about uh, Daesh ISIS activity in Afghanistan. They killed so many people, including Hindus. It was really big tragedy. And the other question about the Taliban leadership's travel sanction. Are they allowed to travel to so many countries, people concerned, especially human rights organizations? Uh, two questions. Let me, let me take the, the first one um, first. Um, of course, we all saw these horrifying uh, reports over the weekend. We, uh, as you heard from several of our senior officials, we've condemned uh, the recent attacks uh, that have killed and harmed civilians in Afghanistan. This includes the cowardly attack that we saw uh, this weekend against the Sikh community uh, in Kabul uh, that claimed innocent lives, including the life of a, of a Sikh worshiper. Uh, this is part of a what can only be described as a concerning trend uh, against members of religious minority groups in Afghanistan. We know that as is the case around the world. Afghanistan's diversity is one of uh, its greatest assets. It should be viewed as such. Uh, and a threat to any minority group in Afghanistan is a threat to the identity, uh, the uh, uh, heterogeneous, identi heterogeneous identity of Afghanistan itself. Uh, Special Representative uh, for Afghanistan, Tom West, uh, Special Representative for Afghan Women, Girls, and Human Rights, Rina Miri, uh, our ambassador at large for international religious freedom, Rashad Hussein, uh, they all put out statements yesterday uh, expressing our condolences to the families of the victims uh, in this cowardly attack. Uh, but again, this was more than one attack. What we are seeing here appears to be uh, a pattern on the part of terrorists, on the part of extremists who are striking at the heart uh, of Afghanistan's pluralistic uh, identity, who are striking against 
Hindus and Sikhs, uh, Sikhs uh, and we must, uh, those perpetrators must be held uh, accountable and members of all minority groups uh, should be protected. In, term, uh, in terms of the travel of uh, senior Taliban uh, officials, uh, this is something that's been discussed uh, at the UN in recent days. Uh, and in line with the Security Council's ongoing consideration of the situation in Afghanistan and uh, council actions in support of the Afghan people. Uh, the council, as you may know, removed from the 1988 travel ban exemption list two individuals who oversee uh, education policy for uh, the Taliban. Uh, with this step, this list now has 13 uh, individuals on it. So in other words, these individuals who are responsible for the Taliban's education policy are no longer exempted uh, from the inability of senior Taliban officials uh, to travel beyond Afghanistan's borders. We proposed that the Security Council take this step uh, to signal to the Taliban in no uncertain terms that its decision to prohibit girls from obtaining secondary education uh, has consequences, inc including very practical consequences like this. Uh, through press statements, the Council has expressed deep concerns regarding the erosion of the respect for human rights uh, in Afghanistan, including uh, for the rights of women, girls, uh, other uh, minority groups in Afghanistan. Uh, <clears throat> so we will continue to coordinate uh, very closely with, uh, with our partners at the UN and, and other stakeholders uh, to hold to account uh, those who are responsible not only for uh, the violent attacks uh, that we've seen inside Afghanistan, uh, but for all those uh, who would seek to erode uh, the rights and protections that are afforded to Afghanistan's minorities. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Tunisia, any reaction to the latest development lately, the demonstrations against the proposed constitution by the president? Uh, we, uh, what we have uh, sought to see um, is uh, we, have we have stood with the Tunisian people uh, in defending democracy and protecting human, human rights, uh, including the freedom of uh, expression, freedom of uh, peaceful assembly. assembly. Uh, this is what is stipulated by Tunisia's constitution and the International Covenant uh, on civil and uh, political rights as well. Uh, we continue to call for a swift return to constitutional governance, including uh, the seating of a new parliament. Uh, we believe that uh, doing so is necessary to restore widespread confidence uh, in Tunisia's democratic institutions. Uh, yes, Shannon. Going back to the two Americans killed while fighting for Ukraine, can you say if the State Department is providing consular services to any others, despite these two, I mean, beyond those two confirmed cases? Any consular services in, in what regard? Or Americans killed while fighting in Ukraine. Uh, I'm not aware uh, that we are aware of confirmed reports of other Americans who have, been, uh, who have died while fighting in Ukraine. And for your stance towards Russia, have you communicated that you will hold them accountable if anything befalls the two captured Americans in the hands of their proxies? Uh, we, we have made very clear uh, to the Russian Federation uh, that uh, we have, and uh, just as importantly, the international community has the full expectation uh, that anyone who is in their custody or the custody uh, of proxy forces who fall under Russian control, uh, their health, their safety, their well-being is the responsibility of the Russian Federation. We've made a very similar point uh, when it comes to, this is a different context, but to Americans uh, who are uh, detained in Russia and also to Russians uh, who are detained uh, in Russia uh, as well. Uh, we uh, recently uh, made this point very clear uh, that anyone who is in Russian custody, uh, but this would also uh, apply to those individuals who are um, in the custody of groups that are under Russian control, uh, that their safety, their well-being, uh, is the responsibility of, of the Russian Federation. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Two short questions on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, firstly, you mentioned um, atrocity crimes advisory group in the in the topper. Um, when you firstly announced uh, that this group will cooperate with Ukraine from this podium, you told they will work outside of Ukraine. I heard a discussion that they might return to the country. Um, was the final decision approved already, and what about the terms? And secondly, um, the Secretary Yellen told yesterday that the um, United States is in talks with the allies to further restrict most energy revenue by imposing a price cap, or as she told, price exception um, on oil, on Russian oil. Any comments on that? Are you uh, in the State Department the part of these discussions, the, these talks, and which countries are on board already? 
Uh, on your second question, I will just say briefly that we are looking for uh, all appropriate ways to hold the Russian government responsible for uh, the war that it is waging in Ukraine, for the violence and brutality that it's waging uh, against the people of Ukraine. Uh, we are looking for ways uh, to uh, ensure that accountability, including with uh, sanctions and to limit the revenue uh, that the Russian government uh, and key Russian decision makers uh, are able to accrue just as uh, we work with the international community uh, to see to it that we preserve uh, the supply of global energy uh, on energy markets. Um, when it comes to our support for the Ukrainian prosecutor general, uh, you recall that last month uh, we announced the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group. Uh, this is a group that uh, is uh, constituted by the United States and as well as our EU and, and UK partners. It calls on uh, the expertise and the experience uh, of many of our non-governmental uh, partners uh, as well. And uh, while much of this work does take place outside of Ukraine, uh, some of this work does take place inside of Ukraine as well. Part of the idea of the ACA is to see to it uh, that, the, uh, that the experience uh, of uh, these groups and of these ind individuals uh, is brought to bear for Ukraine's prosecutors who are building cases, who are collecting evidence, who are preserving uh, evidence as well. And in fact, uh, the ACA had its first formal meeting in Kiev uh, on June 16th uh, with the lead implementing partners from the United States, from the EU, from uh, the UK. And our the ACA's lead advisor, Ambassador Clint Williamson, who himself uh, was a former ambassador, ambassador at large for global criminal justice, who's now at Arizona State University, uh, also participated uh, in the AG and the ambassador's uh, meeting at the border with the prosecutor general that I mentioned uh, at the top. So there is activity that is taking place uh, inside, uh, inside Ukraine, um, but there's a lot of support uh, that takes place virtually and in third countries as well. Uh, yes, Alex. Uh, thanks so much. Now, on Russian uh, aggression, I was quick into that uh, neighboring countries might face uh, Ukraine's fate if they turn against him for the invasion. Now, if you sit in Azerbaijan, Georgia, or Kazakhstan, you might scratch your head and think about whether or not the U.S. will help me in case in Russia has a country. Um, can you explicitly state that the U.S. will not leave those countries alone if Russia does what it says it does? Well, I think we've sent a very clear signal uh, with the support that we have provided uh, to Ukraine, uh, support that uh, totals more than $5 billion uh, in security assistance since the start uh, of Russia's invasion on February 24th. Uh, the way in which that the United States has rallied the international community, how dozens of countries across uh, multiple continents uh, have come together to provide not only the security assistance that Ukraine needs, but also the economic assistance uh, and the humanitarian assistance for uh, the Ukrainian people, just as we have imposed an unprecedented uh, set of economic and financial measures, as well as the export controls uh, that we've spoken to on uh, the Russian Federation. So uh, that is a, a clear signal uh, of the resolve we have. It is a clear signal uh, that Russian aggression against sovereign, independent countries uh, will not be tolerated by the United States. It won't be tolerated uh, by uh, our international partners as well. Yes. Candidate status for Ukraine and Moldova perspective for Georgia. As you know, this is the recommendation. I'm sorry, recommendation uh, of the European Commission, and now all three countries are waiting for June 24, when the decision of the European Union will be announced. Do you think that Georgia also deserves uh, be supported on its way? I understand that uh, this question does not concern you directly. However, your position on the Western perspective of Georgia. Uh, and on this path is extremely important for us. Well, on the question broadly, uh, we maintain our long-standing commitment to a Europe that is whole, that is free, and that is at peace. And we support uh, the further integration of Ukraine and Moldova uh, and Georgia as well uh, with their European uh, neighbors. Uh, when it comes to Ukraine and Moldova, uh, European Union. For all of these countries, though, these are countries that over the course uh, of now decades uh, have expressed a desire for 
a, a closer relationship, closer proximity uh, with the West. Uh, the United States has worked with all three of these countries to help them develop uh, their democratic institutions, to help them develop their system of checks and balances, uh, to help them develop uh, their economies that are integrated uh, with Europe and with the West, uh, and we will continue to uh, stand by them uh, going forward. Uh, the details of the accession processes and timelines, uh, those of course are a decision for uh, the EU and its member states, and so I need to refer you to the EU uh, for any specifics uh, of that process. <clears throat> Excuse me, Michelle. Uh, Ned, uh, on the global uh, food and uh, security, what is the US uh, doing to help ease the situation globally and uh, in the Middle East uh, specifically? Well, uh, we've had an opportunity to speak about food security uh, quite a bit uh, recently, uh, including when Secretary Blinken convened a number of his fellow ministers, about 40 ministers in New York last month at the UN General Assembly and the UN uh, Security Council. This was a challenge that in some ways uh, predates the Russian aggression, um, but there certainly uh, it is a challenge that has been compounded by what we call uh, the three C's, uh, by COVID, uh, by uh, climate change, uh, and now by conflict. And the fact is, I was counting climate change as one, but yes, thank you, Matt, if you want to be uh, literal about it. Um, the, um, and, uh, Unfortunately, it is that final C, conflict, uh, that has had uh, an outsized implication for not only the region, uh, but also for much of the world. The fact is that Russia's forces have uh, attacked, uh, they have taken offline grain silos, uh, they are attacking Ukraine's farmers, uh, they are leaving Ukraine's uh, wheat fields uh, and its other uh, <coughs> plots of arable land. Uh, unusable. Uh, there is uh, there has been an effort to pursue Ukrainian ships at sea that have been carrying grain, uh, and of course there's an ongoing blockade uh, with uh, ships now stuck in port uh, that have some 20, 25 million tons uh, of grain that countries around the world, including in the region, but also uh, well beyond the region, including in Africa. Uh, and as we heard recently uh, at the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, uh, is needed in uh, the Western Hemisphere uh, as well. So we produced a, a global action plan that focuses on five uh, lines of effort. First, we provided uh, billions of dollars, more than $2.5 billion uh, in food security and other humanitarian assistance. Uh, in addition, the president last month signed uh, the emergency supplemental request that provides uh, more than $5 billion, $5.5 billion uh, in additional aid for food, food security around the world. Uh, second, we're working with other countries uh, to mitigate the global fertilizer shortage. Uh, President Biden recently announced a $500 million investment uh, to increase domestic fertilizer uh, production. We're working with countries around the world to increase their own domestic levels uh, of fertilizer production uh, as well. Uh, third, we're boosting agricultural capacity uh, and resilience through uh, the Feed the Future initiative. And this is a, a program that has been uh, longstanding, but is uh, aimed at um, achieving greater longer term resilience to uh, food security, knowing that even uh, if we are able to address the acute near term crisis, uh, that this will be a long term challenge uh, that we'll need to address together. Uh, fourth, we're taking measures to cushion the macroeconomic shocks uh, of this crisis on, on the most vulnerable uh, populations. We're working with international financial institutions, international lending institutions, uh, with international partners uh, on this. And fifth, we're keeping the issue high on our, on our diplomatic agenda. Uh, as I already alluded to, uh, Secretary Blinken during uh, the U, uh, U.S. presidency at the U.N., uh, he thought food security uh, deserved to be the headliner, deserved to be uh, high on the agenda, or the highest agenda, uh, highest agenda item, and it was for that reason. Uh, and I will, ex I would expect that in the coming couple days, we'll have more to say uh, about travel um, that the secretary will be undertaking uh, to advance this goal, uh, to see to it that we can address the near-term acute crisis uh, and also the longer-term implications, uh, not only of COVID and climate change, but of course Vladimir Putin's war uh, on Ukraine and its attendant implications for global food security. Should we expect solutions from Berlin uh, meeting? 
I, I don't think any single uh, meeting will be able to produce uh, a solution. Uh, of course, there are a number of countries, the United States included, uh, that are looking at near-term practical steps we can take vis-a-vis -vis the, the grain that is stuck in Ukraine's ports. That's something that we've uh, worked on with uh, the UN uh, and Secretary Parrish. Uh, it's something that our Turkish allies uh, have been very engaged in. We're supporting their efforts uh, to see to it that uh, Ukraine's grain is to be released. Of course, uh, it could be released tomorrow if uh, Vladimir Putin uh, were to authorize it, uh, if he were to authorize what would be a purely humanitarian gesture that could save untold lives uh, around the world, but that is something uh, that he has not yet done. I think the goal, the goal at uh, the session at the UN, and the Germans have already spoken publicly uh, to a session that Foreign Minister Baerbock is convening uh, later this week in Berlin. But uh, the goal of sessions like these is to continue to put a spotlight uh, on the acute challenge we face, uh, to bring together countries uh, that have uh, potential food supplies, fertilizer supplies, uh, with those who need it, as well as countries uh, who have resources, uh, whether it is food, whether it is funding or other resources, uh, to offer to give them an opportunity uh, to make those connections. Uh, for, uh, let me move around. Yes. In the PLC, uh, can you give us comments about China's claim of successful anti-biotic missile interceptor test on Sunday, as well as recent launch of domestically designed uh, carrier? Secondly, uh, does the United States see the Taiwan Strait as international border? Uh, so on your uh, on your first question, I, I just don't have anything uh, to offer on these announcements that we've seen from uh, <clears throat> excuse me that we've seen from uh, the PRC. Um, uh, on the second question, uh, we made clear last week, I believe it was, uh, that the Taiwan Strait is an international waterway. Uh, that means that the Taiwan Strait is an area where high seas freedoms, including freedom of navigation and overflight, are guaranteed under international law. Uh, the world has an abiding interest in peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, and we consider this central to the security and the prosperity of the broader Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we're concerned by China's aggressive rhetoric, its increasing pressure and intimidation regarding Taiwan, and we'll continue, as we've said before, to fly, to sail, and to operate wherever international law allows, and that includes transiting through the tribe Taiwan Strait. Yes. Two follow-ups, actually, Mr. Price. So one, um, we have, as the war in Ukraine is great shown, we might hear more and more Americans being stranded, killed, or captured in Ukraine. And is there a discussion within the department to take some steps to stop the flow of American foreign fighters to Ukraine, or other than just issuing advisory, travel advisory? Uh, at this point, uh, we continue uh, our efforts to encourage, to urge, to recommend, uh, to do whatever we can uh, to impart to Americans, well-meaning Americans, uh, that they should not travel uh, to Ukraine. Uh, they should not travel there because of the attendant dangers, but also because of the challenge uh, you alluded to. We only recently were able to resume uh, limited operations at our embassy in Kyiv. We are not able to provide uh, the same level of services for American citizens who may be in Ukraine. Uh, that is part of the reason why uh, before the February 24th start uh, of this phase of Russians, Russia's invasion, we encouraged Americans uh, to depart Ukraine, uh, and we are now doing everything we can uh, to urge Americans not to travel there. And also, uh, a follow-up to the reopening of the consulate in uh, Jerusalem. Why does the reopening take so long? Like, what is the obstacle there? It's just reopening the building, like transferring the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem did not take that long. What is preventing you from reopening the embassy? Uh, obviously, these are, these are complex issues. Uh, these are issues that we need to coordinate uh, with the government of Israel uh, as well. But it's an issue that uh, we are committed to, and we're continuing to discuss that uh, with our Israeli partners, with our Palestinian partners. Why, Friend. why should you coordinate with the Israelis while you are opening? for Palestinians? Uh, because this will be in uh, Jerusalem. Francesca. Uh, are you concerned that France and so wait, wait European... But you, you, Jerusalem, as far as your policy is concerned, is divided. 
Well, that's why I said we're, we're consulting. We're consulting with Israel. We're consulting with Israelis and Palestinians. Francesca. Yeah, I was asking, um, are you concerned that France, a major European ally, goes through a um, rare political crisis with uh, President Macron uh, maybe being incapacitated uh, in taking actions for, for a long time in the middle of a war in Europe in the international crisis? President Macron was just uh, re-elected. He has, um, well, I'll leave it to, to French voters to uh, assess the results of those elections, but uh, no, uh, we know, uh, just as I've said in other contexts during this briefings, um, that uh, France is an ally uh, of the United States. Uh, we have uh, every uh, bit of confidence uh, that we will continue to work very closely uh, with the Macron government uh, going forward on the challenge that Russia presents and the other uh, shared challenges that we face as allies. In Colombia, can I ask a question? In Colombia, mm -hmm. where sure. you can. Uh, you know, uh, Gustavo Petro is a leftist, so that was that is the first leftist in I think in Colombian history. He's a former rebel. Last year we had uh, also leftist candidates win the presidency in Chile. Perú, Honduras. We'll probably have uh, Lula da Silva coming back and so on. In your view, is that a repudiation of U.S. policy towards the, the you know the, the, the South America? These are the sovereign decisions of uh, voters within uh, sovereign countries. Uh, I don't think it uh, is in any way a reflection of American policy. Um, I think the point that we heard repeatedly uh, during the Summit of the Americas and something that applies equally uh, to all countries uh, across the globe uh, is the challenge that all of our countries face. Uh, and that is seeing to it that our fellow democracies can deliver for our people. Uh, and I think whether it's Colombia, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Israel, whether it's France, whether it's anywhere around the road, uh, around the world, where uh, we have uh, free and fair democratic elections, uh, people are expressing uh, their viewpoints based on unique circumstances. But again, what unites, I think, uh, much of what we've seen uh, is a desire on the part of people around the world, especially in the midst of COVID, especially in the midst of uh, the uh, implications of, of climate change, especially uh, in the midst of uh, the uh, economic recovery uh, that uh, we are seeking to advance, uh, that uh, people are looking for representatives who are able to uh, deliver on, on those democratic uh, promises. Secretary Blinken, as you know, spoke to President-elect Petro last night. They had a very good conversation. Uh, they spoke about uh, a number of issues, some of those issues um, that do implicate uh, very, uh, th that are very real um, issues for people in both of our countries, public health, COVID, climate change, uh, and the environmental degradation uh, that we've seen, the shared democratic values uh, that unite uh, both of our countries. Uh, so whether it is uh, the new government or the incoming government, I should say, uh, in Colombia, uh, whether it is uh, a partner around the world, uh, we'll be able to um, pursue our, our shared values uh, and our, our shared interests. I have a quick clarification question. Sorry to kind of switch gears here. But um, back on the, the American citizen killed in Ukraine, I know you said you don't want to provide specific details due to the family's privacy, but can the State Department confirm that he was killed in combat specifically? We have confirmed his death, um, but we have not confirmed details, uh, specific details. Are you able to confirm that it was combat related? I'm, I'm not able to confirm any specific details. Just no. not super quickly on uh, on Finland, Sweden, NATO, since next week is NATO summit. So um, it looks like the disagreement between, um, well, you know, Turkey saying no to Finland and Sweden's NATO bids, that, that whole um, disagreement is not being resolved quickly. U.S. has been saying that they would like to see these two countries um, join NATO relatively swiftly. And Turks yesterday said the summit next week is not a deadline. So is it also U.S. understanding now that you're not, the, the summit is not going to be a deadline and this, this sort of like disagreement may well expand beyond that? Or are you still hoping that this would be resolved by then? I don't believe we've ever put a firm deadline on it, uh, of course. I mean, would you like this to continue for months? I we, mean, we, from the we, very beginning, you guys said that, you know, we, you would hope to wrap this up fairly quickly, given the war in no, Ukraine. No, of course, of course. We would like it to be concluded swiftly. Uh, but this is a process that requires consensus 
uh, by all of the NATO allies. Uh, of course, uh, the Finns and the Swedes and the Turks uh, have been engaged in discussions, uh, tripartite discussions, bilateral uh, discussions. Uh, we've heard from them. We've heard them characterize uh, these discussions publicly as constructive and ongoing. Uh, we are not a party uh, to these talks, but we're lending support uh, to our partners, um, Finland and Sweden. Uh, we've also um, uh, had an opportunity to uh, discuss the issue broadly uh, with Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu uh, and other Turkish officials. Uh, I'll do a quick final questions. Any other meeting between the Secretary and the Foreign Minister or President uh, next week uh, in Madrid? Uh, we haven't announced anything yet. Uh, if, uh, if if there will be, we'll announce it in due course. Yes, uh, final. Uh, I'll go to you. I don't believe you've had a chance today. Yeah, I'm Gabby. I'm with Jewish Insider. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, so my question is about, um, there was a, a ban on kosher and halal slaughter in Belgium that was recently defeated. And my understanding is that American diplomats played a, a pretty big role in working with legislators there to vote that bill down. I'm wondering if there's anything you could share about America's involvement in, in that process. I'm not immediately familiar with the details, but we'll see if we can get you any details after this. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.